snap, this one's much better. And they peel off and they'll set up the return. Smith will wave at it and it bounces into the end zone touchback. First down and 10 for the Lopers at their own 20. Got a flag down. We've had several penalty flags thrown in special team situations and punt situations. 13-7 our score. The team's trading possessions to open up the second half. Tom Harris is our referee and a personal foul penalty. Dead ball against both squads. That'll offset. Looks like it didn't even happen. One of those Twilight Zone plays. It happened, then it didn't. Let's take a look at what's going on. There's, there's a little shoving and pushing right there, and then another retaliation. Yep, keeps going. Yep, that's, uh, that's where it happened. That was number seven, Jeff Herdzina from UNO, when 36 Chad Dorman for UNK. Boys will be boys. And the Lopers will have it first and 10 from their own 20. Shane Hatcher, the man in motion. And they work the misdirection with Mike Smith, who's out across the 25 to the 26. Good job again by Mike Smith to just sort of thread his way up inside there on his own. He's limping a little bit as he gets up, but he's okay. They like to run some play action off that pass, or they'll fake to Smith, and you saw Shane Hatcher go in motion. He'll drift out in the flat, and then they'll just come up and dump the ball to him and let him go. Now Smith in motion. Shane Hatcher, little used fullback, started the ball game, but as Adrian mentioned, we didn't see a whole lot of him in the first half. Yeah, I, I just missed him, flat missed him. I saw him a lot last week at the Morningside ball game, but today he was a, a, a non-element in that uh, first half. Six foot three, 245 pounds is Shane Hatcher from Kozad, three-time all-conference player, and there you see the graphic on Jason Morris and a tough, tough player for the Mavs. Third, third down and four from the 26. No back set with Smith in motion and Rutar. They'll put it in the air and put it up short intended for Zabawa, his possession receiver, and that'll force a UNK punt. Casey Anderson will come back in. He's got more carries than anybody. This will be his eighth punt of the day. Rutar that time under through the receiver, but Marcellus Walker, number 49, they're on the coverage. See it right here. They're going to run four receivers deep, two from each side. He looks left. It's all covered up up there. And now it's a one hopper under Zabawa, and that's Walker coming in just in case. Well, the last time Anderson lined up here, they blocked it. They don't come after him as hard. And Casey Anderson gets away a great punt. Jermaine Hill all the way back to the 26-yard line. And a 10-yard return to the 36. First down and 10 for the Mavs. Second game of the year for both of these squads. UNO dropping a 37-30 decision at home last week to Wayne State, a game that Adrian and I both saw and both agreed that UNO, quite frankly, outplayed Wayne State, gave up the big play, actually led by 11 in the fourth quarter of that game. You bet. But some remarkable action in that one. Both teams had kickoff returns for touchdowns, interception returns, fumble returns, and had it all. Long pass plays, 71-yard uh, touchdown pass play, uh, a couple, three long 60-yard pass plays. Probably one of the most exciting games I've seen in a very, very long while. Trying to pick up win number here, number one here, and Jermaine Hill trying to get out to the outside. And again, there's good pursuit. Mitch Wibbles over there. He somehow got by the block. And here you see him number eight out of Central City. Last week, six tackles against Morningside. Watch him just knife through and just knock the pins out from under Jermaine Hill. And uh, that's just a great job. Tackle for a loss. Wibbles' uh, brother Matt played here, one of the best players ever to play at Carney as a defensive back. Loss of one on the play, second down and 11 from the 36. Claver again to throw. Timing pattern executed perfectly, complete to Ed Thompson, number 15, the freshman out of Cambridge. And it was indeed executed perfectly, Billy. Needed to get right up there across the, uh, the 45 to about the 47, just across the 47, and uh, he just got across the, the, uh, the stick and uh, picked up the first down. You'll see it right here. Right where he catches the ball is about a yard beyond the stick, and then he comes back a little bit, just picks it up by about a half a yard. Very nice route. 
first and 10. The Mavs 47. Inside handoff, Sobota breaking tackles, breaking into the open, all the way down to the 28-yard line. Sobota running like a freight train off to the left side there. You get that defense going one way, looking for action coming to the other side, and it's a counterplay with Sobota picking him up. Good yardage down that far sideline. Sobota from Columbus Scotus. See, it's that play action. He faking going to the left, gives it back to the right on the uh, on the counter, and then uh, fortunately, who was that, Sixel? Justin Sixel there to make the hit. We saw Scott Sobota in the Shrine Bowl he dominated the game as a defensive linebacker, defensive end, if I remember correctly. They've got him playing offense here. He's a good football player from Columbus. Marad Cave with the carry across the 25 to the 24. Brueggemann, 94, in there again on the stop. Right now, it's important for Carney to, uh, to just bowl up there on defense because they're, they're giving ground uh, too easily against this mad uh, offense, uh, Bill, and they need to just stop it right here. They've been a key in this football game all, uh, all this ball game. And they need to just uh, bowl the neck and uh, make some out, make the big play right now. That's what they need. Second down six. <laughs> Marad K, that was a slow developing play. Claver had problems when they got situated at the line of scrimmage. He tried to get guys set up right. And Price in there. Todd Price there you see right there. Just a little bit. Uh, actually, it was Claver's. Uh, uh, he took the wrong line off the football right there when he went to make the handoff. He was just too deep and to the left. He should have came over a little bit to the right and just uh, avoided the collision with the ball carrier. So the timing not good on the play. Makes it third and about, uh, call it seven. At the UNK 25, the man's threatening. Claver over the middle. Pass is caught by Tony Kreese. Fifth catch of the day for Kreese. He has been the player of the game for UNL so far. And once again, a great route in that Kreese ran the route, got free to the inside on the seam, and just got across the stick where he needed to get to pick up the first down. Perfectly thrown ball by Troy Claver there. And again, just enough yardage as Kreese comes down, breaks it off, and then the ball delivered perfectly by Claver. There you see the stick in the background, and that's where Kreese had to get to, and that's where he indeed did arrive. First and 10 from the Loper 17-yard line. Rod Cave losing his footing. Brueggemann there to help him lose the footing, too. Number 94, a senior out of Wayne. Big 275-pounder. He's going to come up and get that little booba there at 10 to 2. <laughs> That's not going to keep him out, I can guarantee you. I think, I think if he's bleeding, he's got to come out, though. I think that's the rule to get it patched up. Claver 13 of 27 for 157 yards now in the ball game. He's three of four here in the second half alone. Again, an inside handoff to Sabota, and he's pushed way back. A loss on the play. Todd, Let's say he was stopped at the 19. It'll be a loss of two. Todd Price there again on the hit. Again, the leader of the linebackers are there to make the big play for Carney. We saw those numbers for Troy Claver last year as we see it again here. Now watch the hit there. I tell you, that is a classic tackle by a linebacker. You hit the guy right in the face and the numbers, wrap the arms, drive him back, and that's exactly what you want to do. But Claver last year had his best game of the season against Carney. He was 12 for 23, 117 yards, and threw for a touchdown. Third down, 13. And there's Price again wrapping up Claver. Part of the problem there is Troy Claver saw his receiver, Murad Cave, who was a hot receiver, trip and fall when he came off the line of scrimmage. And so Claver had to decide very quickly what to do as Price becomes another factor here very quickly. Now, see, he sees his receiver go down, but there's Price. A combination of the fallen receiver and great pressure by Price. What a great job by number 32 for the Lopers out of Grand Island. Fourth down and 18. Cosell is in. This is a 43-yard attempt. He's got the distance but not the accuracy. So another good defensive stand by the Loper defense. And the Mavericks come up empty. They're turned away. They got in deep. They got down to the 17. But the defense responded one more time. Now they have got to pick up some momentum offensively to move the ball against the Maverick defense. Let's go downstairs and check in with Kevin Kugler one more time. 
Well, Bill, after that last offensive series by the Lopers, they brought the entire offensive unit over on the sidelines, huddled them up. None of the coaches were happy with them at all. Look especially at the left guard position. That's number 79, Todd Johnson. He got especially balled out. He wasn't staying on his block. Coaches told him if he doesn't do a better job, he's going to be pulled from the game, Bill. Yeah, Clayton Bowman better get his chin strap ready then. Quick pass, Zabawa. Short gain on the play, and a flag flies. UNO taking over a possession here, or rather UNK at their own 25-yard line. Now we'll see what the penalty flag is all about. And the folks in blue like what they see. Offsides against UNO. Just a quick toss over here. Pat Davis, number six on the hit. Had a great game last week against Wayne State. There's the huddle on defense. The defense has done a great job here in the second half thus far. Three times now they have stepped up, met the challenges from that UNO MAV offense, shut them down, and got the ball back for their offense. It is now time for the offense to do the same. Terry Renner is the defensive coordinator for UNK. First and five from the 30. Movement along the line. Rutar's pass is complete to McCabe along the UNO sidelines. He's spun around and thrown out of bounds at the 40, but we'll see what the penalty flag is all about. Should be encroachment, I believe, on UNO over on that left side. Somebody jumped into the neutral zone. We'll wait and see, but that's what it appeared from my vantage point here. Offside against UNO and decline. Well, twice in a row now, we've seen UNK tipping their hand to that left side of the Maverick secondary on the quick pass. McCabe is out there again, number three, along with Zabawa, 89. Simeon Williams is split to the near side. Mike Smith is the setback. First down and 10 from the Loper 40. They trail it by 6, 13-7, and the draw to Mike Smith had little chance. He may have picked up a yard across the 40 to the 41. Good initial contact up front by Jay Weininger, number 51, six foot three, 265 pound redshirt freshman. He stepped up and made the first hit, slowed the ball carrier down. The Mavs showing blitz on the play, then the backers dropped off. Weininger steps up, makes the hit on the draw play. Claire Boroff, watching his local ball club. I mean, Williams sprinting off the field. Now the man, or the Lopers are set. And Hatcher is the man in motion. Rutar with time, and Zabawa had it go in and out of his hands. Cedric Welch, 37, delivering a big blow on the backside that time to Zabawa. Hello. Making sure that that pass was not going to be caught. I to talk to myself. Again, good protection. Offensive line's doing a fairly good job from both teams. Ball not thrown particularly well that time, however. Watch watch the pass here. Both ends going to be up and down rather than the tight spiral you'd like to see. There you see it. That's Maybe a tough ball. A little bit. It's a tough ball to catch. Third down and nine from the 41. Zabawa cut it. Nifty play, Zabawa along the Carney sideline. Tipped it up and hauled it in. Marcellus Walker, the strong side linebacker, was covering on the play, but they put two receivers in that pattern. 14, Rody went out and broke it off. Zabawa sprinted behind him and made the play. Not sure where Robert Brown, number two, the defensive back way deep on the left side. Watch, he'll be coming towards you now. There you see him coming towards you. In that replay, he was uh, the deep left corner that time, and this is just a good read and a good route by the UNK quarterback, Rutar, and Zabawa. But Robert Brown, number two, the defensive back, for some reason came up, was coming up towards the line of scrimmage. Not sure why. First and 10 from the 34, and Mike Smith is upended at the 29-yard line. I think Brown just broke off the pattern when he saw Rody turn in. And that gave Zabawa the chance to make the play. Big, big play for the Lopers here uh, with about 3.50 left and counting in the third quarter. They've moved the ball down into MAP territory now and uh, are threatening. They trail it 13 to 7. Second and five from the Maverick 29 yard line. Smith gets the carry and had no help. Good penetration by Brent Neben. 
Number 90, the defensive end out of Central City. Adrian's hometown. <laughs> it's pretty close. <laughs> Damon Hansen also over there. He's from David City. He's, he's from my hometown also. <laughs> so, so is uh, Troy Claver. <laughs> David City produces a lot of ball players these days, let me tell you. Yeah, Rutar's from Thurston, that's a suburb, isn't it? It's close enough. Yeah, third down and five from the 29. The Rutar retreating. He needs some help. He'll keep it himself. Now unload it, and it's thrown short and intercepted at the four-yard line. Davis over there again, a, a big, big interception. Matt Davis makes his fourth interception in two games now, and none could be bigger than that. That's going to shut down the old Carney drive. Well, the bad news is UNO stops the drive. The good news for UNK is that it's dismal field position, but they do lose a scoring opportunity nonetheless. Ruto here does a good job to get free, but then he makes a mistake. There's pressure right there. He just does not get enough on the football. Tell you what, if he throws the ball into the zone, into the end zone, watch this here. If he throws the football in the end zone, it might be touchdown UNK. But as it is, there's good pressure by number 86 for the Mavs. Again, Hansen over there putting the pressure on. And it's underthrown and it goes over. Whoa. Jermaine Hill hit down immediately by Dave Cunningham, 69. Cunningham, as you might say, just knocked him right off his hinges right there. Great hit by 69, as we talked about before. Six foot three, 280 pounds sophomore. Doing a good job out there this afternoon for the Lopers. There's Rutar in the numbers, eight for 23 at 123 yards here this afternoon. The only problem is you got two interceptions to go with it. Last week against Morningside, Rutard, 19 of 31. Also had a couple of interceptions for 234 yards. This is a much better defensive ball club. Timing pattern. Thompson got past the defender, Franzen, and made the completion at the 33-yard line. Once again, the Mav quarterback, Claver, does that pump action to keep that defensive back, hold him in, and maybe get him going to the sideline. Watch it again here. There's the pump, everybody goes up, that defensive back, you saw him bite on it down there, and then the receiver just goes right on by him, as Bill called it, that's Ed Thompson, and he makes a good grab, and does a little bit of good running after that, too. Here's another shot from the end zone, but when that pump is done, that arm pump, or that arm fake is done by the quarterback, a lot of times that'll hold that back in there, gives that receiver a chance to get going, and there's good defense right there by the Lopes. Matt Bergerman, the nose tackle, in there to greet Scott Swoboda after he took the handoff from Claver. They have lost a couple of yards on the play. It'll be second down and 13 at the 30. Little uh, mayhem in the middle of the line. There you see, what a great shot. That was Bergerman on top. I didn't get the number of the guy underneath. Tom Brew? Number 57 for the Lopers, Tommy Brew. Underneath all of that. Good teamwork by those two people. Second down, 13. Hill on the sweep. They've got it strung out. He's got the speed to get around the corner, and he got it back to the 40-yard line. It'll be third down and three. Justin Sixel, a linebacker from Scotia, finally corralled him and brought him down. Coming up on the one-minute mark remaining in the third quarter, UNO with a six-point lead. Once again, Hill trying to break it to the outside. Six hole there to stop him. Uh, first half, Hill had just 11 yards on nine carries. Good job by the UNK defense to shut him down. Third down and four. Another big play for the Loper D. Claver's pass off the hands of Jake Young. Scott Franzen covering on a play. Brugerman laid a shot on Claver as he released the football, and that'll force another Maverick punt. A nice job by the Loper defense right here to force that punt, but boy, if they could have pinned him back there deep in the Maverick territory instead of giving up that big play, it would have been a much, much better turn of events for the Lopers, Certainly. but they will get the football. Actually, uh, exactly, Bill. Certainly it uh, would have been nice if they could have done that, but they did hold, and that's the key. They held uh, the Mav offense for the fourth time now. The uh, Mavs are going to punt it away. There you saw the numbers for Nate Parks, the kicker. Fourth down and four, good snap. And a good kick by Parks. Smith will settle under it at the 15-yard line, and We'll take it for the fair catch. It'll be first down and 10 for UNK at their own 15-yard line. 26 seconds remaining in the third quarter. A fast-moving third quarter as compared to the first half. 
UNO was a 13-7 lead. The Mavericks got out to a 7-0 lead. Claver hitting Marad Cave in the first quarter. 13-yard touchdown pass. Second quarter, the Lopers tied it up when Chad Rutar hit Ryan Zabawa on a nice catch and run by the junior from Norfolk Catholic. And then with 23 seconds to go, the difference in the game, Casey Anderson's, in the half rather, Casey Anderson's punt was blocked by Tony Kreese, who ran it down in the end zone. Point after was blocked, and that gave us our 13-7 score. Rutar's pass is complete to Ryan McCabe. That was nearly picked off by Davis, who had it timed perfectly, but it was just over his fingertips and into the waiting arms of McCabe, the sophomore from Atkinson West Holt. Pat Davis just simply has a nose for the football. Just within inches of intercepting that pass. Watch it here again. And there's Davis just out of his grasp. If he catches that, it's a six easy, easy six points, that is. Pat Davis from North Lauderdale, Florida. Big story about him in the World Herald there the past couple of days. Shane Hatcher on the final play of the third quarter. Bulls his way to the 30-yard line on a first down and 10 play, and the clock winds down to zero. We've got 15 more minutes of football to play here at Foster Field in Kearney. Still a lot to be decided here on the field. The Mavericks lead the Lopers 13-7. America was founded by some ordinary people who believed that a few simple ideas would change the world. They still can. The American Promise. Ordinary people, extraordinary stories. Coming October 1st to Nebraska Public Television. With resignation, but with resolve, I hereby end 40 years of democratic rule of this house. After the first 100 days of the new Republican Congress, American politics would never be the same. Everybody wants to talk to me about uh, some of the cuts. This program will take you behind the scenes, inside the Republican Revolution. See it Wednesday night at 8 on Nebraska Public Television. ETV Sports Crew, I'm Bill Dolman. Welcome back to Kearney. We open up play in the fourth quarter here at Foster Field, the Mavericks of UNO with a 13-7 lead. UNK with the football to open up the period and the pass from Rutar, intended for his tight end Jason Gibbs, is just off his hands and incomplete. It'll be third down and nine. Floyd Webb, the defensive end, coming in from the left side, just leveled Rutar as he released the football. And he's Still feeling the effect. Well, it looks like he wears a little bit of protection of some kind under there, but man, that kind of hit, just protection or not, it's going to take its toll on you. Third down, nine from the 30. Smith in motion. And Rutar to throw again. He's got the heat. And then loads it to Smith along the sidelines. He's got the first down. We're going to have a personal foul in the backfield as Cedric Welch just came in and, Rutar and just hurt. put Rutar down, and he is hurt. Boy, what a collision right at about the 25-yard line. I don't know that Chad, uh, Chad may have his bell rung on this one pretty good. What a collision that was. Wow. The backup quarterback for UNK is Joel Stair, a junior from Kimball, Nebraska. <laughs> Roughing the passer is the call. That'll be tacked on to the end of the run. But the big concern now for UNK is Chad Rutar. As Adrian mentioned, he got clocked just as he released the football. Oh, that is one of the most vicious hits I've seen in a long while. Number 37 for the math, Cedric Welch. 5'11", 215 pounds, came in. Just as Rutar had delivered the ball, his momentum coming forward after trying to sprint out, they come up field, and it was just two objects going right into each other at breakneck speed, and uh, Rutar got the, got the worst end of it. Let's just hope he's okay. On the penalty, they'll move the football in the UNO territory at the 42-yard line. Tom Harris, our referee, Looking on as they uh, attend to Chad Rutar, 
He's situated in front of the Carney bench at the Loper 25-yard line, and they have not moved him since he went down. And now he's ready to come up. Oh, that's good to see. Very good to see. Chad Rutar is up and moving around, and hopefully he's going to be okay and will return to the field. Now the game goes into the hands of Joel Stair, who played for his father, Keith, at Kimball High. He's a junior. He's been around the program a while, but has not seen a whole lot of activity in the first couple of games of the year. This is his first action today. And it's getting in, thrown into a no-huddle offense. And trying to lead a team to a come-from-behind victory if possible. First down and 10. They call it the 43-yard line. And they'll keep it on the ground with Mike Smith, who slips a couple of tackles and gets it out to the 40-yard line. One thing this will do for the Yono Map defense is uh, they can concentrate a little bit more as far as the running game goes. I don't know that Stair throws the ball as well as, uh, as Chad Rutar. We will find out here very shortly, perhaps. But uh, right now, the Map defense can basically pin their ears up, uh, up front and go for the running game. Second down and eight. Stair played in four games last year. Quick hand off to Shane Hatcher. Falls forward to the 37-yard line. It'll be third down. Corey Andreessen, 57, right there. Stepped up right into the hole. Watch it right here. He'll step up and make the one-on-one -on -one tackle. That's a good job by Andreessen. The running back, Hatcher, 245 pounds against the linebacker, Andreessen, 225 pounds. Andreessen, three-time All-State player in high school, high school All-American, and last year All-Conference player for the Mavs. Third down play. Stair putting it up for the first time. Pass is complete to McCabe. Touchdown! Well, that answered that with respect to my question as to whether or not he can throw the football. A touchdown pass right down the far sideline, and that was just a great catch and a great throw. Ryan McCabe, here it is again. Watch this here. McCabe had number 35 for UNO beat, Damon Gardner. What a pressure pack situation for the stair to step in and get the job done. And now the extra point becomes all critical right here. We're tied at 13. UNK with a 14-13 lead with 13 and a half minutes to go in the ball game. How about that? Joel Stair coming off the bench, and his first pitch of the ball game was a perfect strike to Ryan McCabe, who beat his man one on one down the sideline. That's got him excited here on the Carney side, right below us. There you see McCabe receiving the congratulations from his teammates out of Atkinson West Hall. We'll see it from the end zone here. Stair just looks it right down, stares the receiver down, and then delivers. And man, what a great grab! Because as we mentioned uh, before. 35 for the Mavs. Gardner there. He had his hand in the receiver's face, but the receiver, McCabe, able to concentrate, stay with the ball, and make the catch. I'll tell you, I'll tell you maybe what happened, Bill, is uh, maybe the Mavs just got a little bit too conscious as far as the, the ground game goes. And, uh, hey, let's go. But McCabe was was uh, very exceptional in being able to beat uh, Gardner to the end zone uh, in that case and showed good speed. Well, you would think that... Uh, you get a guy coming off the bench, his first couple of passes, maybe the short out, maybe a quick slant, something to get him into a rhythm, but no, no. Claire Bingo. Borov just let it go. <laughs> he, said, Bingo. he says that, you know, I, he's paid his dues. Speaking of, of Joel Sarah, he's paid his dues in my program. I've got all the confidence in the world in him that when he goes in the ball game, we're not going to lose much behind Chad Rutar. Look he out here. Right there. Here's Jermaine Hill answering back all the way. One man behind him. Can he catch him? Yes. Number five for UNK, Chain McDowell out of Agra, Kansas, ran down Jermaine Hill and saved the touchdown. Here it is again, Jermaine Hill last week. He had the 93-yard kickoff return for a touchdown against Wayne and busts this one right, right at the middle. Everybody 
got bunched up to the outside. You want to maintain your lanes. That didn't happen on the play, and now it's off to the races, and here comes McDowell, and throws right at the last second, right at the last possible second, and brings him down. Jermaine Hill, the senior from Los Angeles, dangerous in the return game as well as in the backfield. Another key moment in the ball game. Marad Cave takes the handoff, scoots into the end zone, and the Mavericks answer right back with a touchdown. I want to tell you, there was a great hole up front opened up by that, off that offensive line. Tony John, Chris Lehman, Wagner, and Garita. Also number 78 for the Mavs. Greg Floyd was in there in the tackle position. And then look at this here, wide open on the right side. And that's just great, great running by Murad Cave. He got number 24 for uh, the Lopers turned around. Scott Franson on the fake and then just took it in the end zone. And man, what fireworks uh, now. Billy, we talked about the big play from last week. Hey, we've had a several big plays again here in this football game. <laughs> What a turn of events in the last couple of minutes. No, the last minute. And the Mavericks will go for two. They lead it 19 to 14. Good move by Pat Burns. Looking for Cave out of the backfield. Claver and Cave continued the pattern, but it's off his fingertips. And it's a five-point contest. That looms big as this game wears on. Absolutely. Opens the door now for the uh, for the Lopers and Cardi to, to come on in. But uh, again, it'll be up to the UNO map defense to get it done. Now watch Cave if we can. Watch him. He's going to be covered on the short route, hooking to the outside. Now well, there's Claver delivering. But what happened was, was Cave just got himself open. He was covered short to the hook to the outside. He turned it around, came back to the inside, but then just couldn't uh, get a handle on the football for the two-point conversion. Let's go downstairs here to Kevin Kugler and get a report on the injury situation. Kevin. Well, Bill, good news for the Lopers. Chad Rutar, all he did was get a helmet into the ribs. All, all, all he did. Obviously, that caused him a little pain, knocked the wind out of him. But Rutar will be back, so that's good news for the Lopers as they now have to try to come from behind. They'll at least have their number one quarterback at the helm, Bill. All right, Kevin. Thank you very much. And Joel Stair, if they need him to come back, he's ready to go. He's proved that already. So Chad Rutar, one tough quarterback, nine for 24. He's had kind of a tough day against this UNO defense. The kickoff settles into the arms of Chad Thompson, takes it at the 15 and gets it out to the 26 yard line. It'll be first down and 10 for the Lopers. And we'll see if Rutar comes in to lead the Loper offense. There you Jackson on the tackle. Just gonna point that out, Thompson on the return and the uh, Jackson making the tackle, and Jackson was in there to try to rip the ball out of the grasp of, of Thompson, but just could not get the job done. Chad hanging on to the football, doing a nice job to return the kick and hang on to the ball. And Rutar is indeed back into the ball game, still holding his side a bit. <laughs> what a competitor. He wants to get the job done against this ball club. 13.07 to go in the game. Hatcher out of the backfield, hauls it in, and steps out of bounds at the 32-yard line. Shane Hatcher played his high school ball at Cozad High School for Gene Hunting. 240 pounds. He's put on some beef since high school. Yes, he has, but he's indeed an excellent receiver and also an excellent runner as we see it again here. Play action, faking over to the right side, coming back left, and there you see Hatcher making the catch last week. He caught six passes last week for 40 yards, ran the ball 14 times for 60 yards. Gain of six on the play, second down four from the Loper 32. 13 minutes even, 19-14, UNO. Rutar avoids Damon Hansen, now runs away from Morris, and Clinton Davis, 99, finally ran him down. And Rutar may have lost a yard on the play. He did. It'll be third down and five. But you saw him go ahead and, and take a dive on the play, and that's what exactly what he needed to do. He did not need to be taking anybody on as far as a hit goes. Chad Rutar, you see everything, uh, well, he avoids contact there. That was number 86 for the Mavs, Damon Hansen coming in. Now watch him here. He's just going to go down. Try to avoid the big hit. Keep yourself healthy. Big play here, third down five. Over the middle, passes complete to the tight end. 85, Jason Gibbs. I believe that's his first catch of the day. 
And we've got a loper who's down on the play. Rutar on the straight drop. Tight end, Gibbs just making sure that he's got enough yards to pick up that first down. And the player down, a little tough to get a number on, but boy, they're, they're motioning awful quick for the, uh, the ambulance, which is located off to our left, the northern part of the stadium. And we've got a lot of folks coming out there. The stretcher's coming out immediately. This is the part of the game, Bill, that I just dread right here. And if it's what I think it is, we don't want to show it to you. You can you could just see in that last shot that they're gingerly working or holding that left or right leg of the injured player. But boy, they, they wasted no time in calling for the ambulance to come out. The, the, the board is out. And there is a lot of concern for the young man who is down. And boy, it is awful silent here at Foster Field. Not quite sure the number right now. And we don't want to speculate, especially in a situation like this. Well, as I mentioned, it's the part of the game that I really dread. I uh, hate these moments in football, but unfortunately it happens. It's a violent game, a violent sport, and you, you just would like to see this not happen, but it does. And let's just hope that everything is fine and fine in terms of, uh, of a recovery, because obviously it's a very serious matter. 12-13 12, 12 to go in the ball game, and we're told that it, that uh, is Ryan Zabawa, number 89. The outstanding split in for UNK. And uh, the pass was complete to Jason Gibbs, the tight end. And Zabawa had come in, and when Gibbs went down, appeared to fall on the right leg of, of uh, Ryan Zabawa, and they are now pumping the air support. And what they have is a, is a collapsible uh, cast that they can put around the, the injured area. And they inflate it then and immobilize the area, and that's what you see right there, that, uh, that gentleman that was pumping it up right there. But the vantage point that we had from the press box, uh, we, don't, we didn't have it on camera, but just what we could tell, it was not, uh, not anything that, that uh, we needed to show the folks. We'll try and get a report as soon as we possibly can, but it, uh, it appears to be somewhat of a serious injury for Ryan Zabawa. Earlier today, the Cornhuskers again had an easy time with the Michigan State Spartans. And you'll be able to catch Big Red and wrap up on Tuesday, letting you know what some other things that are happening on Nebraska Public Television. Tomorrow night, look back at the history and enjoy the music of the Rolling Stones. See clips from their concert tours and go backstage for exclusive interviews on Concert Collection tomorrow night at 10.30 here on Nebraska Public Television. And what the heck, if you want to call in on Tuesday night and talk about the Stones, we'll do that too. <laughs> Start me up. Start me up, I tell you what. <laughs> check that one out. That'll be a great show to, to take up, and then, uh, then maybe we can look at Mick Jagger as being a wide receiver one these days. <laughs> well, the Huskers rolled over Michigan State. Uh, how's that? <laughs> Again, they, uh, the, the Loper training staff continues to work on Ryan Zabawa. And Michigan State today is saying, you can't always get what you want. <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean Nebraska got satisfaction? <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't know how we can work Angie in on that, but uh, I was trying to figure that one out. <clears throat> Didn't quite come up with anything very quickly, but we are at a delay here at Foster Field in Kearney. We have an injured uh, Kearney player, and you see the air cast that has been applied to the right leg of Ryan Zabawa. Four catches today, 105 yards, and a touchdown, and. He's meant a lot to this team today. He's meant a lot to this program the last couple of years. He's a junior out of Norfolk Catholic, an all-state selection. Caught 10 passes a year ago, and you see a, a wave to the folks here at Kearney. A lot of concerned people in the stands. and Well, you certainly have to feel for that young man. I'll tell you what, he's a fine football player. And we talked to the folks here at Kearney about Ryan Zabawa the last couple of years that we've done Kearney games, and they say nothing but positive things about him as, as a student athlete, a, a real real just class person for this program and what, what you see in, in a UNK program, you a lot bet. of people like him. Just the kind of guy you want in your program, again, all those things you just mentioned, a, a pressure player who 
comes to play every day, comes to practice every day, and gets the job done. And there you see uh, there he's being attended to right now. So we can only say, uh, Ryan, let, let's hope that it all comes out well for your partner and you get back and get on with it. But uh, make sure you're well and and ready to go. Well, there will be a couple of prayers set for him tonight. Boy, you hate to see that. Really, really hate to see something like that. Hmm. Puts that game in perspective, doesn't it? Sure does, Bill. And again, I, it, uh, it, it's, it's the most dreaded part of this thing that, uh, that you see, and, and it's the dreaded thing. You, you just hate to see it happen. And I, every time I see one of those situations come up on a football field, it, it gives you those second thoughts about why do you play. And, but again, it's a lot of things that occur on the football field also that are very, very positive, and it's going to happen, unfortunately. So you... You deal with it and you go on, and that's what they need to do, and Ryan Zababa will do that. He is a pressure player. He is a competitor, and he will recover, and uh, we will see him uh, hopefully again. Ryan is a junior this year. So let's hope he can recover from this uh, and hopefully get back to the field. Uh, we don't know the extent of this injury, but it obviously appears he's going to be out for the rest of the year. Let's hope that he can recover and uh, come back and play next year. He's just been a, a credit to this program, and uh, you want to see him come back and have a great senior year. Well, they, they had motioned for the ambulance to come out even even before the training staff reached him, so you know it's, a, it's something serious. But again, he motioned the crowd, went off the field with a wave, and uh, our thoughts will go with him. But we've got a football game to be played. 12-13 remaining in the contest. The Lopers trailing UNO 19-14 in possession of the football. First down and 10 at their own 41-yard line after the completion to Jason Gibbs. See if they can rally around for their fallen teammate. Brutar hit from behind, coughs up the football, and it's loose. And who will get to it first? It looks like UNK has recovered the football. Damon Hansen there to make the hit and cause, uh, cause the fumble. Big Chad Volkun, 72, the 6'5", 290-pounder, smothered the football. Brutar. Watch yeah. Hansen come in here on the replay, 86. Bingo right there, knocks the ball loose, separates the quarterback and the ball. Hanson, 6'4", 230 pounds from California. And then it's a fight for the football, and as Bill said, Bo Kuhn comes up with the ball, and the, and the Lopers retain possession. Second down, a loss of 12 on the play. It'll be second down and 22. Take it to Smith. Flags fly. Pass is... Uh, incomplete, intended for Simeon Williams, number 88, Nathan Tate, 32, the defensive back covering on the play. But almost immediately after the snap of the football, the flag was thrown, and the indication from Tom Smith holding against UNK. This is a play that Rutar throws so well. He does such a good job because he's got such a strong arm. He can throw that 20, 30 yard out with great precision. The ball just a little bit out of bounds right there, so... It will not count, obviously, and there was a penalty on the play anyway. So now the Lopers will line it up one more time and see what they can do on third down and 19. From the Loper 29. 11-21 to play. They need the 49 for the first down, and Rutar's got to scramble again. Picks up some yards to the 36-yard line, but well shy. Clock running now, down to the 11-minute mark. It'll be fourth down and 15. And Casey Anderson will punt it once again. Watch the backside pursuit here. K or, uh, Morris, Jason Morris is going to run Rutar down. There you see him in behind, uh, giving chase. Rutar avoids the hit by number 86, Damon Hansen, and Morris is there to finish him up as he goes down the sideline. Anderson to punt. Gets away a good one. Hill will take it at the 16. Avoids Rody. 
Boy, you see Elusa fumble the football and got it back. Oh, man. <laughs> He's got quick feet and he also has quick hands. That's about the quickest I've ever seen a guy go out and snap the ball back uh, after he's fumbled it. But again, a very good run back by Jermaine Hill. Dancing, threading his way north and south. That's what you want to see. Let's go down to Kevin Kugler. Well, we're over here with uh, one of the sidelights of UNK Stadium. This is Dennis Dopp, and this is the cannon that fires after every UNK score. Tell us a little bit about how this cannon got started, Dennis. Well, we, when we had ROTC here at UNK, we had the cannon for four years. ROTC went away, so we've continued the tradition with another cannon and, uh, organized as the Antelope Artillery here on UNK. It's the first year for it now. Now, this cannon used to be in a different spot. Uh, yes, it was on the north end of the field. It created a little bit too much noise, and we, for the courtesy of the people that live up there, we moved the gun down here. Well, Bill, every stadium seems to have its own sidelight, and the antelope artillery and the cannon is the uh, sidelight, the little extra added touch here at UNK. <laughs> Put a silencer on something like that. <laughs> I think every antelope in the country would be glad to know that there's an antelope cannon <laughs> right here in Cardi, Nebraska. Second down eight. Rod Cave taking the pitch, taking it outside, and the play got strung out. Very nicely, Justin Sixel on there with the pursuit. Scott Franzen finally threw him down, number 24. It'll be third down and another key play for the Loper defense. It seems like they've had their backs against the wall the entire second half so far, and they've come up to answer the call. They've answered it all four times, uh, quite frankly, uh, here in the second half, but Franzen doing a great job. You called his number, number 24, stringing it out. He took on the block from Scott Sobota put him away and then stepped outside and took care of the ball carrier. So Franson doing a fine job on that left side. Third down six. The Lopers stacking him up along the line of scrimmage. Showing blitz. And here they come. Flavor won't have time. Dave Cunningham, the defensive tackle, smothers him and brings him down at the 30. D.C. from D.C. got him. David Cunningham, David City, he got there again. He's just, he's unstoppable on the play. Splits the, splits the defenders and boom, he is in there. Tony, John and company just didn't have enough bodies in there to handle all those guys coming in blue. Fourth down and six. Fourth down and more than that. Fourth down and 16. Great haircut, David. We love it. <laughs> that punt was nearly blocked. Roger Skies coming in there. Fielded by Mike Smith. Doesn't have a whole lot of room to run. He and Jake Christensen back there, and they got kind of tangled up, but UNK will have possession. And the local offense will try and give the cheerleaders and folks here at Foster Field something to cheer about. 19-14 our score with 8-12 to play in the game. Keeping that spirit up here, the Loper cheerleaders. Number one, yes indeed. More like a 10. <laughs> to see where Kevin is. <laughs> see if he was running camera on that. <laughs> it's not halftime anymore. First down and 10 from the 22. Pass is complete over the middle. Mike Smith out of the backfield. Picks up the first down. A nice throw by Chad Rutar. And what a hit by Ben Titus coming up playing that free safety spot. Watch this hit over the middle and Rutar is going to set up. Receiver on a route over the middle and bingo right there. That just doesn't get better than that as far as hits go. Hit the ball carrier drove him back. Usually when I try to make yards after contact but didn't happen there and that's because Titus had that momentum and just forced the ball carrier right back to where he came from. Hatcher out of the backfield with the completion. Gain of a couple to the 40-yard line. Nathan Tate making the stop. Right there, that had the makings of Hatcher, the 245-pound running back. Watch 37 here. That's Cedric Welch. He's going to come up and make the play, but you got the makings of a big, big collision right here, and that well, doesn't quite happen. Welch does knock him down with a little help. Two big forces on each uh, on each respective team. Here are the numbers on Ruta. 15 of 31, 180 yards, second down and eight. He steps up and is thrown down. Jay Weininger, 51. 
Jason Morris also 54 underneath it all. He was first to arrive and uh, slow Rutar down. Right now the UNO map defense doing a fine job to shut down the Lopers here with 6.52 left. Third down eight. Take a third down and 10. Loss of two on the play. Back to the 38 yard line. Rutar surveying the defense, changing the play. Larduna is the setback behind it. And they'll swing it out to Arduna off his hands and incomplete. There's a lot of white jerseys out there, too. I'm not sure that play would have gone very far had he hauled in the pass. Really, really don't think so, Bill. Pat Davis was over there. He was ready. He was coiled and ready to make the hit coming up uh, from the right side. Arduna, 5'11", 195. We'll see it again here. Freshman out of Omaha. Brownell Talbot product, and there was Davis right there. He was just, like I say, coiled and ready to spring. But since this was not made, he held up and took it away. Fourth down and 10. Right, right. Wobbler off the foot of Casey Anderson, fielded by Jermaine Hill. Well, he is so dangerous anytime he touches the football. Gain of about 10 yards on the return, but boy, they all look interesting as soon as he starts heading upfield. Chad Dorman on the coverage. He is always a threat to go. There he is, number five. Watch him here. He's just going to weave his way. There's a miss. There's a miss. Yeah, there's another miss. Three misses, and finally two or three guys arrive to bring him down. Jermaine Hill. There's very, a lot. Very seldom do you see him brought down by one guy. There's a lot of misses on the play, but there was also a penalty flag. Illegal block indicated against the Mavericks, and that'll set them back all the way to the 10 yard line. Big penalty marked off against UNO. Jermaine Hill last year uh, in the game that we had, UNO, UNK, certainly had an uh, in inauspicious debut, shall we say. <laughs> Scoring a touchdown, had a big 33 yard run, if I remember correctly. Get back to that in a minute. Troy Claver, 14 of 24, or 14 of 29, rather. 187 yards, first down and 10. And the handoff is to Murad Cave. He's stacked up and driven back. Pat Gilbert, the nose tackle, making the stop. But Jermaine Hill had the big touchdown run. Ran along the far sidelines and in his excitement and I don't know what else. Exuberance. <laughs> Youthful exuberance, let's call it that. Well, I was going to say brain lock, but... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Jermaine ran to the far corner of the end zone and then proceeded to run all the way to the near side of the field and heave the football into the stands. And I talked to Gary Anderson, the sports information director at UNO. He said, uh, Jermaine settled down a little bit. He's really matured in the last year. That's, that's good to see. But that was one of the most unbelievable things I've ever seen they got in the game. <laughs> he, uh, he recovered, however, last year to lead his ball club in rushing and also uh, Garner's second team all-conference honors. Is, watch this play right here. Number 20 for the for the Lopers is going to come up. Jeremy Gee and knock his oh. pins out, and Sobota goes out with some sort of an injury there. Well, you saw when he put his hand down to brace himself, the arm kind of locked up a little bit, and so he went off holding his wrist. Seven carries, 23 yards on the day for Scott Sobota. Third down and 10 as he got the ball back to the original line of scrimmage. Flavor to throw. Jake Young too tall. And another good defensive stand. That'll bring the folks to their feet. And the Lopers will get the football back. Absolutely, Bill. Well deserved. This Loper defense in the second half has been tested five times. And they have answered the call on each of those individual times. This ball overthrown, but... Had it been thrown perfectly, number 24 for the Lopers, Scott Franson, there to make the play. But he just he didn't need to do that because the ball was out of reach, uh, out of the reach of Jake Young. Nate Parks will punt from his end zone. He and Casey Anderson have been busy today. The Lopers should get this in good field position, and they will. Smith thought about fielding it and watches it bounce out of bounds at the Maverick 45-yard line with 4.45 to play in the game, and the Lopers trailing it by five. They need to get into the end zone to take the lead. This is where it gets interesting. We've seen 
An excellent afternoon as far as the kicking game goes here. And there you see the numbers with 445 left. The Lopers have the ball at the 45 yard line of the Mavericks uh, with that much time left to go. And can they mount a drive? It spells doom for UNO. It's UNO's turn as far as defense goes here for them to answer the call. And let's see if they can get it done. But again, the kicking game has been a major factor in this football game here this afternoon. First down and 10 from the 45. Rutar, who was dinged up earlier, and watched as Joel Stare through the touchdown passes come back in. A chance now to go on a potentially game-winning drive. The pass for Smith is dropped. He threw it behind him, but Mike Smith had a big, big gain if he hauls it in. Threw it behind him and low. A very, very tough catch for him to make, but this guy is athletic enough that he can indeed make this play. We'll see it again, ground level. Good shot here from a linebacker's viewpoint. And then Rutar winds it up. Watch right here. The ball's just going to die, and it's going to be low and behind, and that's just a tough, tough play for Mike Smith to make. Son, you're not going to get that many more opportunities like that. Second and ten. To the air, and it's deep and overthrown intended for John Rohde, who had gotten behind the defense. What do you think about this, going for it all? Or why not take it a little at a time? Yeah, usually with 440 on the 445 on the clock, you want to try to burn some time off, chunk it off, pull it off like they have all, all game, and then, uh, and then try to get it done. But this is uh, an all or nothing right here. Receiver is wide open again. He gets into that uh, seam in the zone. Some sort of busted coverage in the back end there, but the ball, again, overthrown. 14 of 34, 180 yards and a touchdown. Two have been picked off. He'll throw again. Over the middle, behind the re into receiver and nearly into the official. Damon Hansen there, the pressure on the quarterback, Rutar. Here you see Mike Smith again. But again, Rutar being pressured very severely by Hansen from that right side, that defensive end on the right side. Watch again, top of your screen, 86. He beats the block over there. Off of number 72, Chad Vokun, and then comes in and pressures Rutar. One thing Chad may have to start doing is looking to run a little bit more. It looked like he had some open territory off to his left and had a blocker out there. Instead, he elected to throw the football. Fourth down and 10. Less than 20 seconds on that drive. High in the air. And it'll bounce down at the three-yard line. Dandy punt by Casey Anderson. First hit by a Carney player at about the six or seven yard line. Let's see where they spot it. Well, they're going to, they have it spotted at the three, but the referee is saying there's Rutar coming off, or check that. Casey Anderson on the punt. It was first hit at the seven yard line. They spotted it first at the three. Let's see if they spot it back at the seven or eight yard line. It looks like they will spot it there. I want to remind you folks who are tuning in at the 7 o'clock hour for Statewide here on the Nebraska Public Television Network that we will join that show immediately following the conclusion of this ball game, and we invite you to stay with us. This promises to be an exciting conclusion. UNO leading the UNK Lopers 19-14, 4-17 to go in the ball game. UNO with the football, but deep in their own territory, and Claver airing it out for Tony Kreese. Good coverage man-to-man -man by Jeremy Gee. Kreese trying to get deep down the sideline, just a fly pattern down the sideline, and Claver trying to deliver all over a throw. And here it is again from the end zone camera. One thing all day that Claver has had, and that is time to throw. UNK defense not able to pressure him a great deal here this afternoon. Clock hasn't been moving too much the last couple of possessions. UNK took over with 445. They were three and out. UNO putting it in the air. This is Jermaine Hill. He'll keep it on the ground, and that will work the clock a little bit, but he doesn't pick up any ground. UN UNK defense again answering the call, Bill. Sorry to interrupt you there, but uh, again, that defense answering the call, and it's now third and long, as you were going to point out, I think. And uh, what becomes uh, very uh, uh, critical here now, if, if they don't pick up that first down, we've seen a problem with the snaps here today, and uh, that snap is going to be critical for UNO because the snap is going to go in the end zone. Time is on the side of the Mavericks, but the field position isn't. If they have to kick it away, UNK will have it in pretty good shape. Third down and 11, big play here. Claver airing it out. Kreese has a step and threw his hands incomplete. 
Scott Franzen covering on the play. And right now the pressure is on number 71 for the Mavs, Bob Wagner. He is the deep snapper for the Mavericks. He needs to get a good, solid, quick snap here. Here's the throw by Claver. Again, showing that strong arm. He has thrown the ball a lot today, and it's just right. Well, again, you got to catch those kind. Went right through his fingertips. Fourth down, 11. The ball at the six. Parks gets it away, and it's not a good kick. It'll roll dead at the 47-yard line. That's about as good as the Mavericks could hope for. Three minutes and 13 seconds to go in the game. UNO 19, UNK 14. Each team with three timeouts remaining. This game went down to the wire last year. UNK won it 13 to 12 in Omaha. That ended a four game UNO winning streak in that contest. EJ Hancock took a 13 yard pass from Chad Rutar. 33 seconds left to go in the ball game. That tied it up. Mike Rowan added the point after. UNK traveled 74 yards in just under two minutes to win that game. We're in a similar situation here. Rutar, 14 of 35 in the game. Setting ourselves up for another fantastic finish, and Rutar's hit, loses the football, and Hanson is on it. Number Never football. Number 90, Brent Nevin, is the guy that caused the fumble. You can celebrate all, all, all around the sidelines over there, but you ought to be congratulating Nevin for knocking the ball loose. Hanson, the guy that picked it up, but Nevin, the guy that caused it. There's a few folks from Omaha and the surrounding communities that have made the trek in Maverick red and black, and they can celebrate, but 3.03 remain. Troy Claver and company. Marad Cave getting to the outside and getting a first down out of bounds at the 39 yard line. No, he's still in bounds. But the clock will stop when they move the chains. 2.53 to play. Well, the Loper defense has done everything in this ball game to win it. Absolutely, Bill. I tell you, they, you, you can't ask for a better effort here in the second half from the Loper defense. There's Cave again. Just bowling his way up, bowling his way up, finally picks the first down up. Sixel there to make the hit. 94 also, Matt Brueggemann there also to make the hit. But the chains are moved, clock stop. Chains are now set. Clock has started, 245 and counting down. Marad Cave, 19 carries, 79 yards. Another carry, his 20th of the game. He battles for yards down to the 35-yard line as the clock continues to wind down, and UNK wants to take a timeout. Let's go downstairs quickly to Kevin Kugler. Well, Bill, more bad news, unfortunately, on the injury front, this time for the University of Nebraska-Omaha. Scott Sabota, if you remember, one of the last offensive series for the Mavs, he was on the field, tried to break his fall with his arm, came up holding his arm in obvious pain. Unfortunately for Scott, he tore, at least tore a ligament in his elbow perhaps has a fracture in his arm as well. So bad news for Sabota. Obviously, he's not returning. His status for the rest of the season will depend on an expert they'll get in Omaha with turn, Bill. Well, you hate to hear about injuries like that. Again, we want to remind you folks who are joining us at 7 o'clock, expecting to see statewide, you will, we will join that show in progress at the conclusion of this ball game. Claire Borov with 2 minutes and 23 seconds Try and figure out a way to get six more points on the board. Right now, his main concern is getting the football back. They had the ball in good shape midfield, but Rutar got rocked by Brent Nevin, and Damon Hanson picked up the fumble. We haven't seen a lot of turnovers in this game, but boy, the ones we've seen. They've that been one major. In particular was a big one. They have been indeed critical as Pat Burns, are you see? Just two minutes and 23 seconds away from winning uh, his first game this year. And right now, the Mavs. Basically, you'd have to say they're a first down away from setting up a victory here. They pick up another first down. It's going to be very, very tough. So the Lopers get the ball back and get the job done. Cave on the ground, stacked up at the line of scrimmage. Brueggemann hit him immediately. It'll be third down, and UNK wants to use its second of three timeouts. 4,108 folks here at Foster Field. A nice crowd. 
on a beautiful day in central Nebraska. 68 degrees at kickoff. Boy, the weather the last few days has been fantastic in this state. Bill, on that absolutely oh, boy, meaningless that. play, Murad Cave went into the middle and came up limp limping very badly. It's that right leg, and you see that is the knee that he injured a couple of years ago. He has that black brace on that uh, right leg, and again, on, the, on a, just a, a waste play, basically, he comes up injured. Watch here. He's going to hit up into the inside and come up limping out of this. Somehow he got twisted, got, well, he just sat on it. Basically, the right leg got caught underneath him and he got pushed back and sat right down on it. And that is not a good sign. There you see him writhing in pain. Well, next week, these two teams continue on with their 1995 schedules. Carney will take on Moorhead State here at Foster Field. UNK has got an interesting schedule similar to what the Cornhuskers have. A lot of home games early on. Nebraska has five home games in a row beginning next week. Carney, four of their first six contests are at home, then just one of the last four games will be here at Foster Field. They take on Moorhead State next week. Omaha, as it looks to North Central Conference action, and that's tough every year, will take on Mankato State in Mankato. You got Savota hurt. Jermaine Hill drug down from behind. A great defensive play. That'll set up a punt. Great defensive play by Tony Daly, 55. Middle backer steps up, grabs a handful of jersey, and is able to stop Jermaine Hill. You don't see that happen very often. Marad Cave is now coming back into the football game, and I'm not sure why. He's in there on the kicking team. He's the short man. Uh, you'll see the kicker Nate Parks line up and Murad Cave. He's still limping very heavily on that uh, right leg. Wow. That's a mistake. I wonder if somebody just flat missed it and put him back in the ball game. I don't know why he would be in there for this. You can see him limping off there. Yeah. There he is, 33. <laughs> 205 on the clock. UNK has used all of its timeouts. Boy, you go back to that fumble. They had the ball first down and 10 at the 50. Three timeouts. All they need is a touchdown to get into the end zone to win it. They trail at 19-14. UNK led briefly in the third quarter when Joel Stair came off the bench and hit Ryan McKay with a 37-yard touchdown pass. Jermaine Hill on the ensuing kickoff returned it 82 yards to the 18-yard line. Murad Cave and took it the rest of the way in the next play. Nate Parks punts it high and deep and into the end zone. It'll be a touchback. One minute and 58 seconds left to go here in Kearney. And the Lopers will have, well, you got to believe, one last chance at it. First down and 10 from their own 20-yard line, 80 yards to go to win the game. They can indeed get it done. They've got a, a quarterback with a gun back there, Chad Rutar. He can throw the ball, like I said earlier on, about as well as anybody I've seen at this uh, this level, and frankly, uh, up in Division One. But they have a lot of ground to cover in a minute 58. It's been a lot of fun this afternoon, and it only it's only fitting that this one ends in a dramatic fashion between these two teams. It was this way last year, and UNK come back to win it in the closing moments once again. They're off to a good start. Rutar finds McCabe. He's knocked out of bounds after a 12-yard pickup. Good throw, good route. There you see number three coming back, McCabe. Again, Pat Davis there just missing an interception. Watch number six, white jersey, top of your screen. Missing right there, and what a great job of concentration by Ryan McCabe to make the hit. Brown also over there. How heartbreaking would this be for UNL? Two weeks in a row to have victory in hand. Rutar looking over the middle, intercepted! Ben Titus, the freshman from Omaha Burke, playing center field with the interception. The pass was overthrown, and UNO, with a minute 47 to go, may have win number one in 95. Rutar setting up here, looking downfield, going for that middle route, that post route, and just simply overthrows the receiver, and Titus is there. You're in that deep defense. You just want to make sure in that deep defense nobody gets behind you, and that's what Titus was doing, playing deep center field on the defense, keeping the receiver in front of him at all times and at all costs. It pays off on an overthrown ball, a pass interception, and now the Mavs a minute 47 away from picking up a win here. 
First and 10 at their own 39. Of course, they'll keep it on the ground. Jermaine Hill wrapped up and brought down after a game. Ben Titus is another one of those outstanding quarterback recruits that uh, Pat Burns brought into UNO this year. And I, I, I kind of wonder if he said, came into camp and said, I thought it could be quarterback. And he said, no, 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 cornerback. <laughs> You know, Bill, one of the things that, that I noticed in looking at the lineup, Ben Titus is a holder for place kicks. Now, Ben's from Omaha Burke, and Paul Kozel is a place kicker, and he's from Omaha Burke, so I'm sure those two connected last year, a, a, you know, a significant combination there, a good move by uh, Pat Burns. Coming up on one minute remaining in the game. Bill will carry, Brueggemann will bring him down. You really have to give some credit to this Kearney defense. They played fantastic football in the second half, and as we talked about earlier, gave this team every opportunity to win the contest. Credit you and all for sticking with it and, and holding on when it looked like UNK may have the momentum uh, going into the latter stages of the fourth quarter. But right now, as the clock winds down to 40 seconds remaining, it looks as though UNO will improve to 1-1 one one on the year, matching their win total for all of last year. You know they're going to have a whole lot more in 95. UNK will drop to 0-1-1 one one as they look ahead to a home date next week with Moorhead State. 25 seconds should be the final snap of the ball game. It was a good one. It really was a good one. And I want to just echo what you said about the UNK defense because five times the pressure was on in the second half and they were there to make the call. Pat Burns, I don't know if he's going to get the old uh, Gatorade shower or not. Let's see. There's Don Leahy congratulating Pat, some of his assistant coaches. And again, a big win for, for those uh, gentlemen right there. But again, the UNK defense, you tip their hat, tip your hat to them. They did a fine job in the second half. UNO stuck right in there. They kept after that 75-yard kickoff return by Hill, followed by the cave uh, run for a touchdown, and that was a ball game. A lot of fun this afternoon in Kearney. Pat Burns gets his first win of 1995 in his second as the head coach at UNO. I want to thank Gary Anderson, the Sports Information Director at Nebraska Omaha, and Brent Robinson and Aaron Babcock of the Sports Information Office here at Nebraska Kearney for their fine work. Two great guys. We appreciate all the help that they give us. A lot of fun this afternoon. Again, the final score, Omaha, UNO beats UNK 19-14. NCAA Division II College Football is brought to you in part by Nebraska Cellular, the talk across Nebraska, the official cellular provider for UNK Athletics. And now for Adrian Fiala, Kevin Kugler, and the entire NETV sports production crew, I'm Bill Dolman. Goodbye from Foster Field in Kearney. We now join the following program already in progress. You're looking at the early stages of a retail and civic center plan. It's a plan that's still in its infancy. We know that there is some support, but we need to know how broad it is, and we'll be trying to measure that in some fashion in the next uh, few months. Called the Holiday Park, it consists of two motels, a convention center, movie theater, and several retail stores. The cost? anywhere from 11 to 13 million dollars. Financing to help build the park would come from voters' approval of a half-cent sales tax referendum next May. If approved, millions of dollars would be generated in Norfolk. I feel that it will uh, benefit the city in terms of bringing people into the community. The two motels will be built and ready by next spring, regardless if voters turn thumbs down on financing plans Reporting for Statewide, I'm Jack Wang, Major 9 News. We hear all the time about kids getting in trouble, but we don't often hear what happens to them. Tonight, Brad Penner takes us to one of the places where boys go to get their lives back on track. Brad? Jana, we're talking about the Nebraska Boys Ranch near Alliance, and we need to make it clear that not all the boys who live there have broken the law, but many have. They are boys who steal or fight or run with gangs. Some come from the larger cities and towns in Nebraska, others from rural communities. They wind up in an isolated, beautiful place where they work hard at changing their own lives by experiencing life at the ranch. Ah! 
It's like a picture postcard. Nothing says Nebraska like a herd of cattle moving across a sandhills pasture. But the young men on the horses aren't seasoned cowhands. They're boys from the Nebraska Boys Ranch. I'm thinking of a little boy that came out here and had never seen a horse in his life, never been out of the city of Omaha until he came to live in Nebraska Boys Ranch. And he got along fine, liked it. I can remember the first time he rode a horse, he laid over the horse's neck with both arms around her neck for fear he'd fall off. The boys who come to the boys' ranch learn to ride and work cattle, and they do other chores that need to be done on a ranch. I enjoy living out here at the ranch. There's a lot of things to do. Nick grew up on a farm, and he knows his way around a tractor. Andy comes from a city. He didn't expect to be a cowboy. Never rode a horse in my life until I came here. But Andy didn't come here to ride horses. He came here for the same reason a lot of boys come here. He got into trouble with the law. Uh, I had trouble with my family, and I just got in, I just started shoplifting and stealing things. And I just got in a bad group of friends and stuff, and got caught one too many times. The Nebraska Boys Ranch is a place where boys go for help. We have a lot of children who come to us who are suffering from depression. Many of them are conduct disordered, which means they're acting out in the community against property, violating the laws, not respecting the rights of other people. Also, uh, some are involved in drug and alcohol, um, suicidal, maybe some gang involvement. It's a, it's a wide variety of problems that kids come to us with. The biggest concern, I think, that wouldn't surprise anybody is uh, the, the level of aggression and, uh, and the violence that, that a lot of these kids have been exposed to. Terrence knows violence. He's from Omaha, and he's been involved with gangs. Basically, where I lived, uh, excuse my French, it was hell. That's where I lived. Terrence was at the boys' ranch once before. I didn't want to leave the first time because I knew if I went back to Omaha, then I was going to get in trouble like I always did. But when I left the first time, and uh, during that three months, I mean, this gang stuff just started piling on and stuff, and I just started getting, you know, I mean, just kept getting in more trouble. People wanted to fight me, and then they just started hitting up into violence and stuff. So, I mean, just got sick of it. Terrence decided to go back to the ranch, not because of the horses. I hate horses. I hate horses. He came back because he says it's keeping him alive. And he says without the boys' ranch, he wouldn't have escaped his gang lifestyle. For the most part, it's been working pretty good. I mean, I still got that little uh, mentality, the gangster stuff in me. But I mean, in time, it'll probably, you know, just, I probably just grew out of it. Life in the Sand Hills is a far cry from city streets. Sometimes that change in environment can help trigger other changes as well. It gives a guy a time to get away from home and think, you know, kind of think about what he has to do and what he needs to get done, you know. They're not sentenced to the ranch. Uh, we're not. Uh, an organization where somebody says you have to come here, although that's kind of qualified sometimes too. A lot of times they're saying, yes, I want to go to the ranch in place of the fact that they're saying, because no, I don't want to go to someplace else that's a, usually a lockup type of uh, facility. Basically, a boy has to say to Mr. Bobby, yes, I want to go live at Nebraska Boys Ranch and try to change my life. If he says, I don't want to go out to that place and I'm not going, we don't accept him. You might be surprised to know that the wide open spaces of the Nebraska Boys Ranch really are wide open. You won't find high fences and locked gates. A boy could leave if he wanted to, but that doesn't happen very often. If a boy does run away, first question we ask is what did we do that caused him to run away? And I think that's very important. Dick Haslow came to the Boys Ranch 27 years ago. He has a simple philosophy that seems to fit the Sand Hills. 
His first rule is to be honest and upfront with the boys. Whatever you expect for them, lay it out as to what you expect and why you expect it and why you think that will be a benefit to them. Added to the honesty is a generous amount of love for children and a willingness to show them. And if you portray that to a kid, then it's a lot easier for him to leave his family or to leave his friends uh, wherever you came from and come out here and be surrounded by people who genuinely love to be with children. And, and, and I think that kids sense that, particularly boys who have come from a, a background where they've been abused or neglected, they sense immediately if you do care or if you don't care. Miles is a good example of what honesty and love can do. Lately, he's been refinishing the furniture. It's a way for him to use talents he's discovered since he came to the ranch. Nobody really cared about me at home to sit down and talk with me, but out here, my house parents, they sit down and talk to me about whatever. You know, they talk to me about anything and everything, just like real close friends. It's different than at home, so I consider this home now. If you see that they want to help themselves and you know that you see an improvement in them or changes, then you know you're doing your job and it makes you feel pretty good inside knowing that you're actually helping somebody out. What do you want? The boys' ranch isn't a work camp. That's only a small part of what happens here. There are counseling programs tailored to each boy's needs. And there's time for fun, too. A trip to the swimming pool in Alliance is a daily event during the summer. I think it's pretty important. Um, the guys get to socialize with the kids in town, you know, with some people more their, their age, their kids they went to school with, you know, they get to see them throughout the summer. Fun in the sun isn't automatic. Boys have to earn the right to go to town by demonstrating good behavior. As they improve, they move up a system of levels, eventually reaching the point where they go to movies and visit friends on their own with very little supervision. Our goal is to put as many real life situations before the kids as we can. We try to create an environment that would be as, as natural as you can within the confines of a structured group home. That's a good feeling to know she trusts them. Michaela Valdez doesn't care why Andy and Dan are at the boys' ranch. She just knows they're fun to have around. If, as a matter of fact, if we were to leave, she'd probably wonder where they're at because she, I think she considers them to be her brother. Really, she does. Don Valdez, her husband Jean, and little Michaela help provide an important ingredient of ranch-style rehabilitation, family. A lot of them come from homes that really fight and argue, and if they can be, build, relationship, build relationships with her, then they should be able to do it at home, too. It's pretty stressful, but it's, it's also rewarding. You feel pretty good knowing that a boy's being helped out, you know, and if he sees changes in himself, then you know inside that you're doing your job and it makes you feel pretty good inside. Almost four graduates in our house out of eight, which I think is pretty impressive and we're very proud of them because we've come a long ways with them. They've come a long ways. I don't know, I just started thinking a lot more and I just... think you have to have a strong support system to make it, or else you can't make it if you don't have a strong support system. I asked about like every week or two, like what I needed to work on and they told me and I just worked on it harder and just finally succeeded the whole thing. <laughs> a sand hill sunset marks the end of another day at the ranch. But as darkness falls, another boy arrives to make a new start at the ranch. Our whole purpose for being here is to try to help that boy that's coming through the front door. That could be a real positive thing for me. You think so? Yeah. You're looking forward to it? Yes, I am. Sean graduated from a treatment facility once before, but when he got out of there, he got into trouble. He stole a car and a truck. He was supposed to come to the ranch once before, but he ran away instead. Then he got another chance, a meeting with Jim Bovey. He showed me a video of the boys' ranch and explained to me what I'd be doing. It was kind of like a day runs. It's how the school situation goes during school year. I'm helping. Yes, you are. Sean will get plenty of help while he's at the ranch. He'll have a chance to get his life together. Dick Haslow knows it can work for Sean. He's seen it happen for 27 years. And they were kids who were headed down, down the drain when they came here. And now they're married, 
fa nice families, nice wives, uh, good, good jobs, a lot of them with good jobs, and they're scattered all over the United States. They're all good kids. They just need some help. Reporting for Statewide, I'm Brad Penner. wonder what it's like to go to a one-room school. Very few of us experience it firsthand. But next week, you can see what it's like here on the Nebraska ETV Network. The four-part series, Last of the One-Room Schools, begins Monday night at 8. The series chronicles a year at the Burr Oak School near Broken Bow. Tonight, we get a glimpse of the first day of school. Touchdown. Everybody has to be on the line or behind it, okay? I can say this. She's a better teacher than I had in the teachers in California. Touchdown! Yes! She's really nice because she'll help you and she don't like to just annoy you and go to someone else. She gets right up to you and helps you. Okay, right there, Katie. She's nice. And she gives you candy. And most teachers don't give you candy. I don't want you to go home today and your parents say, what did you learn the first day of school? And you said, oh, nothing. We don't want a day of school to go by, but what you learned something, JR. I think one more thing you may have learned today was to spell August. Yeah. Let's hear it. A -U Whoops, what did we forget? Capital A U G U S T. You're perfect, Jr. Think about what you learned today, what you can take home with you to learn, and maybe remember the rest of your life. We hope. That's all the time we have this week. Join us next week for a look at an issue that a lot of people in Nebraska would prefer to not even talk about. The prospect that some young people might be cheating to win a blue ribbon in the livestock competitions at the county fair. Surprised? So were we. We'll tell you why next week. Thanks for joining us on Statewide. Good night. Insanity reigns tonight on the Saturday Double Feature with an evening of W.C. Fields. First at 8, he teams up with Mae West in My Little Chickadee. Then following at 9.25, see him again as a drunken security guard in The Bank Dick. All tonight Statewide on Nebraska is funded Public in part Television. by the Shoemaker Family Foundation of Cambridge, Nebraska. Building bridges of understanding between rural and urban Nebraska through its support of statewide news programming. Programming on the Nebraska ETV network is funded in part by the Nebraska State Education Association, providing 127 years of advice for quality education for all Nebraska students and teachers. This is where you enjoy the finest performing arts. From the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, this is your Nebraska ETV network. This program is made possible by a grant from the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund, investing nationwide in programs that enable people to make the arts an active part of their everyday lives.
Hello, I'm Hugh Downs. Welcome to Backstage Lincoln Center. When the New York Philharmonic opens its season on the next Live from Lincoln Center telecast, we'll hear the orchestra under maestro Kurt Mazur in one of Richard Strauss's most exciting tone poems, Don Juan. If you've ever come early to an orchestral performance and heard an orchestra tuning up, it might be hard to imagine that the hundred individuals are preparing to become one. And you might think that it's the conductor who brings order out of chaos, but it isn't. What makes a symphony is the orchestral score, and the score is the work of the composer. Now, we may think the composer's job is mainly coming up with wonderful tunes and musical ideas, but that's selling it short. In the orchestral world, there is a middle step between melody and symphony, the orchestration. And great composers like Richard Strauss can actually hear the sound of the entire orchestra in their heads. Now, you might think that all composers write out the melody and then fill in the rest of the parts later. But Strauss was able instead to sit down and write out a 40-line score vertically, that is, filling in all the parts as he went along. So we see that the orchestrator is truly a man of many parts. It just bursts forth, breaking out like a volcano. All these runs and twirls of swirls, etc. The whole orchestra is playing now with a tremendous crescendo. And writing orchestral music, you have to write every note for every instrument. The score contains every note for every part individually. And the score should be regarded as a blueprint that tells the players and the conductor how to make the piece. And at the beginning of an orchestral score, you're given a list of the instruments that are in that orchestra. And it's a list from top to bottom with the woodwinds and the brass in the middle, and then the violins and strings on the bottom. When we talk about music in any, in any facet, from the composing point of view, from the performing point of view, it's very ephemeral. Because, you know, you can't touch it. Uh, you can't smell it. Uh, and yet it's there. And in orchestral music, there are so many facets that have to be dealt with before this thing gets off the ground and goes through space into one's ear. One of the marvelous things about an orchestra concert is the sense of space. Things happening on a broad panoply before you, analogously to, to a stage. Even though you may not know exactly that's the saxophone or the horn playing, you know that things are moving sonically around. There's also the element of what we call instrumental color. When you do that with a trumpet, it's a, a, a new dimension. So much of the quality of the piece is there in the piano version. But when Ravel orchestrates it, it's really as if he's taking a brush. And, and in a way, coloring it in. In the Baroque period, we often have just strings and a couple of wind instruments. And if you think of Mozart, you only have oboes, bassoons, violins, horns, and other strings. By the time you get to Beethoven, uh, you're likely to have trumpets and trombones, wind instruments. And then when you get to something like Don Juan, you have two large flutes, you have piccolos, oboes, English horns, clarinets, two bassoons, contrabassoon, four horns, three trumpets, three trombones, lots of timpani, and then a whole battery of percussion, including triangle and bells and glockenspiels and harp. And you've expanded the palette enormously, really over a period of 100 years. Strauss knew the orchestra. He was a conductor also. 
and uh, he he uh, knew what instruments could do. He wrote for for just about every instrument there was. Composers will come to a performer and ask, is this possible on your instrument? Is this fingering? Is this interval? Is this trill possible? Can you start on the very high register pianissimo? Strauss knew the, the winds very well, and uh, he knew they could do what he wanted and make the effect he wanted. The clarinet and bassoon has a wonderful duet. This is man and woman. And if he gives a, the um, woman's voice to the oboe, he does it so tender and so beautiful. And then Don Juan himself this more man-like, dark sound. The horns, they are so elementary, so full of passion, so, so uh, uh, like an eruption, like a volcano. This breaking out in the brass is outstanding. The horns especially were used by him in a very new way. It's a, a, a new dimension of music. It's a sound of such extraordinary transparency and uniqueness, uh, it immediately charms listeners as being...